What is up, guys? It is Stu, and it is another episode of the What the Fuck Gym Talk podcast. I've got Marty Flanagan on here. He is the brand president of Iron 24. If you've been paying attention, I have been, I always talk about the two biggest nuts that a brick and mortar owner has is it's rent at first, and then it becomes HR. Eventually you get to a level of sophistication and your payroll is, um, it's a big nut that you got to crack every month. And it's, it's one that carries the most emotion. You know, these people, this is their livelihood things like that. And I've talked about for years that I, I think micro gyms, especially in the small business world, need to run as lean as possible. And when I say micro gym, I, you know, I'm generally talking about the group boutique fitness scene, you know, definitely mom and pop owned, um, could be franchised, could be independently owned corporate, whatever it may be, but run, run as lean as possible. There's not a lot of margin in this business and you know, it'd be better if you'd have less people at the table eating more. And then comes Marty and iron 24. And I read an article about a staffless, essentially you guys are an HVLP model, correct, Marty? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So a staffless HVLP model, and I get instantly intrigued. I'm like, oh, so does that just mean like they're using apps? Like, no, it's legit staffless other than the cleaning crew that comes in nightly. So I go down the rabbit hole and uh, I get connected with Marty here. And uh, Marty's gracious enough to come on the podcast today to, to talk shop. <laughs> Marty, if you wouldn't mind, sir, if you would give everyone like the 90 second wrap up, kind of how you got to where you are today, your quick overview uh, of time in the fitness industry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've been obviously just like a lot of people probably like working out since you were like 13, 14 years old and you're watching, you know, I had two, I had two albums growing up. I had Richard Simmons and I had Gene Simmons, like when I was little and there were actual albums. So I got like very different books. Simmons. Yeah, very, yeah different. very different. There's actually, I actually have a presentation called the Simmons effect. And when it, when it comes to how I, that's how I really got introduced to this whole world of like exercise. I was super little and it always just intrigued me. I listened to it over and over again. My family was overweight and I thought to myself, I'm just not going to do that. So I started working out at a young age and, you know, ESPN watching, you know, flax in the morning. And, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to, to work at a health club really young, sweeping floors and just trying to figure it out and no cardio in the place at all, just strength, just a bunch of old school strength guys everywhere. And uh, then I had an opportunity to, you know, start selling equipment when I was 18 years old. And then next thing you know, I stumble into, you know, which is known today as, you know, probably the premier quality health club, which is Lifetime Fitness. And I had a chance to work next to Brown McCrady and a lot of other greats out there and um, in the fitness world. And then stumbled into getting recruited to go to Colorado and come back to Minnesota and I had an opportunity to, to start off with Anytime Fitness when they had 50 locations. I was their sixth employee. So I grew up in the world of fitness and franchising. And um, I had an opportunity to support franchisees all over the country. And uh, that really just changed my life to be able to sit with these entrepreneurs, be, in their, be inside their fitness center, be inside their Anytime, be, uh, go to their house, eat with them, hang out with their kids and really got a chance to know who they are. And, um, you know, then that brought everything back around to what we're doing today is, is I look back at those times and I see the opportunity that they had and the opportunity that Anytime Fitness gave them. And I'm like, okay, that, that is like meaningful stuff there. Like, how can we do this again? In a, in a way that um, goes after those same type of average folks that I got along with so well. So this time and, you're uh, franchising anytime fitness. We're not talking about lifetime fitness. Yeah, yeah, Got correct. Yeah, and so I went since, from lifetime to, to actually went to 24 out in Colorado. Okay, came back went to anytime, and uh, you know was inside the corporate office. You know, uh, building that brand with them for 12 years. For everyone listening, just to kind of understand, a lot of gym owners in the space kind of clump all them into the category of like Globo Gym. There is a there is a definitely unique. So we look at a. a a, a lifetime fitness. We're talking a premier premium health club um, on the same wavelength, at least the, the certain tiers of locations as maybe an Equinox, if you would, at a, a much higher tier brand club. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we look at any time fitness, uh, you're looking at, you know, those were, they were one of the first guys alongside snap fitness when they came out to come out with the 24 access key code, uh, key card access yep. um, much more of an HVLP model. Um, 
and and you're the franchisee and the people who are going to open these locations. These are far different socioeconomic classes of individuals. Someone you're not getting someone to open up a lifetime finish. You're getting multiple someones to put in money to open yeah. up a lifetime. Yeah. You could though. I mean, you could have a single operator. Uh, you know, not even a multi-unit guy open up an anytime fitness, and that that's a realistic franchisee mm -hmm. portfolio. You know, or uh, avatar for that brand. Would you say correct? Yeah, I would say that's correct. You know, Lifetime's their big corporate entity. You know, I think they're private now, going to go public again. Um, and then now anytime, obviously, you know, their brand was built off the backs of the average entrepreneur. That's how that brand was built. I was there. I was with them. I spoke at the conferences. I spoke at URSA. You know, I taught their new franchisee training. I traveled the country. And um, that's how that brand was built and snap. And if you really look at the history, you know, what's old is new again, you know, um, you go back a long time ago, the gymnasiums, you know, they were just a bunch of really, you know, gymnastic equipment, right? Yeah. And, you know, then we look at what Curves did and Curves did a fantastic thing for the fitness industry and opened up all these opportunities for these smaller underserved communities. And then that spawned the smaller square footprint franchise model, like the snaps, the any times, the workout mm -hmm. any times. And then that spawns boutique space. So what have what has all this done? They have actually they've actually created a very well educated user. All that hard work that the boutiques put in, the CrossFits, the base camps, the Orange Theories, you know, they have put a lot of work in into creating a very well educated member. And same with the any times and snaps. So where do those members go now? If they don't want to be paying two hundred and fifty dollars a month anymore to a boutique, where where do they go? I Some agree. Will go to an anytime. You know, I, go ahead. Sorry. So, no, no, no. You're you're you and me. We're speaking so much of the same language. So when I saw your staffless uh, model with Iron 24, and we're going to get into kind of the, the conception of it and, and how that all started. But just at a higher level. So everyone kind of, you know, I want to certify like a place a thesis. One of my theses here is that I believe that especially, you know, CrossFit was the juggernaut, you know, for everyone who's not maybe as familiar with um the fitness industry historics of the businesses curves was the fastest, most successful franchise model back in the day. It was, a, if you were not familiar with it, your mom might've gone there, essentially selectorized equipment, leg extension, bicep or whatever in a circle, one instructor, X amount of women. It was kind of like musical chairs, like to be an interval, you'd be out there for X amount and every, all the women would get up off their machine and move to rotate to the next one. It was fucking adorable, but it worked. Now, yep. if you also know Curve story, you know a crash and burn story is, is coming soon thereafter. But it did open, just like Marty said, it did open the door for this boutique thing, kicking the crap, the the financial crisis of 2008. And that actually is the thing I believe opened the door for CrossFit because CrossFit was able to operate in these shitty flex warehouse spaces that landlords yep. were given one, two years away, just fucking sign a five-year lease, dude. I'm so underwater on this thing. And now you got these you know, ropes hanging from trusses and bay doors, no air conditioning, raw, no AC, the whole thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then we evolved to the orange theory show up and, and F45 and where we are today. But, Marty said something that I just screams in my soul is that you can't educate a population of fitness enthusiasts for 20 plus years at the level that boutique does because mm -hmm. boutique was the first business model that came out that educated you how to move. You had your health club, globo gym type model, but you had to hire a personal trainer. Otherwise you were just fucking figuring it out on your own. Now you got boutiques. We got almost 20 people just coming in, ed getting educated, doing bar for a little bit, then spin, then CrossFit, then orange theory. After a while, they no longer need your recipe, whatever your mm -hmm. recipe is. They be like, you know what? I'm looking at this workout at Orange Theory. I don't really want to run on a treadmill for five, seven minutes, but I would like to use the rower and get strong. I'm going to go to my local gym because they have a concept two rower there, a bubble rower, and they got some dumbbells. Or I go to CrossFit. I don't want to do 300 wall balls. I like to do 10 sets of three back squat though today. And now I need to go somewhere else, but where can I go for that? And that's where I see this HVLP opportunity with like an iron 24 that is uh, that I believe we have educated some consumers out of the micro gym boutique market. Mm -hmm. And in the, what happens is, is if you look at how, when people go out there and they look at these any times and these snaps or, or anything else there, when, when these bigger franchises and not ripping on them, they've done great things and they're going to continue to do great things. But, not all of them are created equal. You go into one is completely different than the other in terms of quality of equipment and in our quality of the space, cleanliness of the space. 
And after about two weeks, anybody going into a fitness center after two weeks, you don't talk to the manager anymore. You're not talking to anybody there. You're going in, doing your thing, and you're leaving. And with uh, such a roller coaster ride and the differences between one brand's location three miles apart, um, you have a lot of choices. But um, the, the downfall is, is not everybody wants to work out in the same gym. It's a small square footprint. You notice every little nook and cranny that's wrong, right? Or in, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. And we present an option for it to be zero staff, get in cap memberships. Everything that we do is tech focused. We put the member in control, uh, fitness plus recovery. That recovery aspect is a big umbrella, just like the fitness side of it's a big what do umbrella. You guys have for, what do you guys have for recovery at Iron Dwarf? Yeah, so, yeah, so we actually have one of the highest quality infrared saunas. And obviously we do hydro massage, cryo, you know, the cryo heat beds. And, but the infrared saunas for one are really quite incredible because they actually have all those three different heat levels that you go to with your core where a lot of infrared saunas only do one or two. Um, obviously we, we allow our franchisees to have choices. So you can do a Theragun station, which they have a fantastic setup for fitness centers. You know, obviously working with hydro massage, they have a lot of great self-controlled, the, uh, obviously our infrared sauna company we work with, that's our preferred vendor. They are fantastic. We got great pricing. So that's another big part of this we can dive into later is why are we able to do this with the same pricing as the monsters that are out there? These huge franchises, how come, how come uh, and anybody can come into Iron 24 as a franchisee and get the same, same pricing structure as these huge monsters? And we've, our relationships over the years have worked. That's great. We can talk about the wonderful friendships, but in all reality is we really dove into um, not taking those big rebates. And that's like a, that's like a huge thing to talk about in the, you know, and I've gotten text messages from people like, why are you even talking about that? And I'm like, cause it's true. And you're going to be taking 10 to 15% rebate back on equipment. Um, you're explain making more everyone, money. Explain yeah. everyone how this works in the franchise space. Yeah. So in the franchise space, you have preferred vendors and required vendors. So if a franchisee comes in and they're going to go with, let's say techno gym, which is one of our preferred vendors. If they go with Techno Gym, a typical franchise system will get, um, you know, typically a 10 to 15% rebate. So when you go out and buy $200,000 worth of equipment, you, the franchisor is getting a rebate of 10 to 15%. Are you kidding me? So that means your harder money, your money that you've loaned or that you've put an SBA or that you've saved is now getting kicked back to the franchisor just because. That's how it works. Well, what about the royalties? What about my franchise fee? Where is that going? Why are you getting a kickback? Well, you buy 200 grand, they're getting 20 to, you know, they're getting anywhere from 20 to 40, $30,000 back in their pocket. And that's a savings that should be passed on. That's a lot of equipment. You know, strength is cheap. Cardio is expensive. 30 grand, you can get a lot of strength. And uh, so we, we push back on that model. Because believe it or not, I've talked to every single preferred vendor, equipment manufacturer that I've spoken to, I'm not going to name names, but every single one of them has said that these franchises are actually making a higher margin on and higher profit on the equipment than the manufacturer is because they're gouging it in these rebates. And there's also the franchise fee. You get these franchise fees that are forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. It's because they're using brokers and it goes out to a commission. So again, your money getting paid out in a commission, not going directly to the franchise to support you, uh, which is what your franchise fee should be doing. So we've pushed back, we've done a, we've, we've redeveloped this into saying, you know, let's take this and go for, I, we want to work with the average entrepreneur. Will we work with a, a larger group? Sure. But that does have a lot of vetting. I don't care how big your group is. You have to go through a vetting process to be sure that we're going to be, you know, rightly teamed up with each other. And the average entrepreneur, same so on, thing. On paper, what do I have to look like? Like uh, net worth, liquidity, things like that. You know, um, we like the net worth is kind of a, a moving target, right? Net worth can be seen in a lot of different ways. So I focus more on what is, a, what is, what is the availability of your resources? You may only have $50,000 in cash, but you have an 840 credit score and every bank around the corner is asking you to do an SBA loan or do an unsecured loan. 
And and right now the lending market, people are a little like, well, it might be this, it may be not a good time, believe it or not. Right now, some of these unsecured loans are a lower percentage and are fantastic opportunities. So there is, you know, we want to focus more on, we don't want you opening up broke. We want you having operating capital, but we also need to know the number. So when we start talking with somebody before you're a franchisee, I really want to understand your number. So that number could be what you're approved for. That number could be what you're comfortable with risking, but we need to know that number. And as we work together in the vetting process and going through this, once we have that number, now we can find spaces. Now we can understand, do you need to lease your equipment? Can you buy your equipment? Do you need to lease your strength, buy your, you know, lease your cardio, buy your strength? So we dive into those things and that's how we're able to, and we work with you very closely in the beginning. Got it. So if I have, if I have $50,000 of, of cash available, I've got a good credit score, I own some real estate, whatever it may be, you guys will maybe, you guys will help hopefully maybe find, if I'm the right person for your model, find a way to get me financed and, and come up with that solution. But, it, but it, same as you would with the guy who has $350,000 in cash and eh, okay credit score, uh, thing like that. So do you guys, I mean, but is there a barrier to entry? Like eh, bottom line, we need to see in some combination of what, you know, your borrowing power or your own personal capital. Yes. This is like, yeah. what's the, what's a, in what's one unit is going to cost, what would one unit cost to open? You know, I under, just give it a, a tier two basic yeah, market. Sure, sure. Yeah, I we we um that's actually really quite easy. It's right now everything that we're doing the the fifteen locations that we have under development are ranging between two hundred and four hundred. Now, Got there's it. one that's coming in quite a bit lower because um, it was an actually it was a, a another fitness center space. They ended up not op- you know leaving the space. Two hundred to four hundred all in, all in yeah. with. Real estate develop upfit and equipment. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Every wow. we have fifteen. We have fifteen locations right now under development. Not one of them is over four hundred grand. Not one. How many square feet are we talking for your model? About about anywhere from four thousand to six thousand. Got it. Okay. And so well, here's another here's another example in Texas. A guy had a since you mentioned it earlier, CrossFit space. Okay, it's in a industrial retail is what we call it. And um, they that's, a, that's were, a very nice name for it. Yeah, <laughs> they were retail. open for yeah, yeah. They were open for about nine months, and they walked. They just left the space. Brand new build out, brand new bathrooms, brand new shower, brand new office, brand new floor, perfect. Right, space isn't big enough. Forty foot ceilings. So, <laughs> so worked with the landlord because the space itself was only thirty three hundred square feet. We called the landlord. For the for the franchisee, not for corporate office location, worked with the landlord. They're building a mezzanine. Oh wow! To put the cardio. That's, it's going to be yeah. beautiful. It's going to be a flagship location. Yeah. Working with the landlord, building a mezzanine. Only need to replace a couple pieces of flooring where they're going to dig into the concrete. That's it, and put flooring up in the mezzanine. That's it, and that space will be open with H a brand new HVAC, a mezzanine, and equipment for right around. I would say it's probably going to come in around 250, 270. Yeah. You get, you get lucky in real estate sometimes to find, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure type scenario. So in your model, you mentioned earlier, and I, I agree with this, you know, I would, uh, I will, I'll talk with some individuals who have uh, a mom and pop global gym model. And we talked today and it's like, it doesn't make sense for someone who's not overly capitalized to go and drop $300,000 of pre-core cardio equipment it just you what you've just signed up for is a recurring six month maintenance headache it's it's guaranteed to be obsolete in two to three years yeah. um and a lot of you guys are a lot of the guys are going with less sexy but bomb proof and reliable ergometers concept two assault shit like that things that yeah. like again people could pop on but it costs them nine hundred dollars per unit versus <laughs> seven thousand dollars for a tread and, yeah. or an elliptical or some kind of stationary bike so but and then what i'm seeing a lot of is consolidation you just saw what world gym did with their new legacy model they're going all yep. strength based yep. what, what's the breakdown if i walk on the floor and i'm looking at floor layout what percentage of the floor space is going to be cardio equipment versus strength in an iron 24 yeah, you, when you really break it down, you look in our space, you're going to see cardio recovery. Obviously, you're going to select rise. You're going to see the free weight functional, right? 
seems like a lot into a small space, but it's meant to be in a 5,000, 6,000 square foot space with not 3,000 members, right? We're not looking for that. Actually, you start getting over a thousand members, we have a problem, you know, because for space size. Mo I always tell everybody more members, more problems, right? You do have that. So you gotta be careful. Um, our spaces, you're gonna see the majority of it's gonna be the functional, the strength, the selectorized. It's it's the majority is not gonna be cardio. Um, cardio looks impressive, but you know, it, it does well on a tour, but in actual application, it's not not used. And the seasoned user, I mean, they're not getting on an elliptical. A seasoned user is getting on the treadmill, yanking up, you know, cranking up the incline, getting their heart rate going, and then they're going right for the strength, right? That's the typical more boutique and seasoned user, you know. So you get the step mills. The we, we would rather go with treadmills, step mills, rowers, uh, the airdyne, you know, the trainers more than ellipticals or our stationary bikes. If we have a stationary bike, we like to have at least one bike because if somebody goes through, you could go through a knee surgery and you need a bike. Um, I know there's a lot of other things people can do, but um, we keep it very basic with the cardio uh, and we let our franchisees choose, but we coach them through it. I look at there's two real avatars in the fitness industry. There's you're going after people who are looking to start their fitness journey or looking for people who are looking to evolve it. Maybe they run around their neighborhood and now they're looking to join their gym. They did CrossFit and now they're looking to do this or looking to evolve it to the next thing. Obviously, we you will have a mix of both, but your marketing generally has to go after one specific type for it to be kind of uh, niched in and for the message to land. It sounds like you guys are going to leave that starter fitness. Let let Planet Fitness do their thing. No, you're not going to yep. Planet Fitness is, is a fucking Goliath. Let them take the starter fitness. I'm intimidated. I don't know, Dick. It sounds like you guys are going after that more seasoned Evolve My Fitness avatar who maybe did boutique classes. No longer mm -hmm. wants to watch, you know, have orange, orange lights or red lights in their face and some dude on a fucking mic and is following a la 2020, the growth of online fitness programming is following a Marcus Philly, a Sydney Cummings or what, you know, any of these mm -hmm. people, um, a Matt Free, whatever programming model they might follow and just doing it on at, at their own speed at a gym like Iron 24. No, you're exactly right. I mean, everybody's going to choose their own different coaching model, right? Everybody's going to they like their own virtual coaching or their nutritional coaching. They're going to do their own app. There's even all the different workout apps out there. So part of this is allowing the member to have the freedom to do their own and not kind of strong arming them or pushing them into anything, but let them kind of choose their own path. We'll have, we already do have, um, you know, the top different apps of this gym or that gym. So they actually can see what other members are enjoying in terms of their app. So there's a whole sharing part of this and community that there's not a bunch of names, but they are going to be voting and polling on the different, different coaching apps that are out there, which there's tons. Why get in the content battle? I don't want to get in the content battle. You know, I, that's not something that we want to do. We keep it very basic, but we keep it clean, affordable, affordable cost of entry for entrepreneurs. The, also going back, all those gyms, all of these fitness centers, these franchises, they've done the smaller footprint. The average user walks into our a smaller footprint facility. They're expecting 40 to $60 a month. There's no 5,000, 6,000 square foot clubs that are 10 bucks a month. They can't keep their doors open unless they're in somewhere where maybe they own the real estate and they got 9,000 members in there. You know, we, we work with our franchisees building their Excel performa, but I mean, really before their franchisees. So they have a really good idea of what to expect in their space. And uh, we don't, we don't require grade A retail. Uh, I was just talking with a friend. Uh, she owns two fitness franchises. She, she had one, she's had one for over 10 years. She literally moved it across the street, 550 grand, not including equipment to <laughs> open the doors. Yeah. 6,000 square feet blows my mind, blows yeah. my mind. What, so let's talk about this. You guys are talking about, um, I got, you told us the square footage three year. We're talking around five, 5,000 square feet on average, something like that ballpark. Yeah, you yeah. talk about membership cap at around a thousand. So what is the monthly cost for an iron 24? Even actually lower than that, depending on the size. If I, if I'm working with, like I'm working with so many candidates right now and I'm, I, I like to build their performer around 800 tell them to go okay. with 800. 800 at 5,000 square feet is a really safe number. So let's build the performa. I ask, I ask them to build a performa because in franchising, we have some uh, laws we have to follow. So I ask them to build a good, bad, and ugly performa. And I kind of give them the parameters of what that means. And then they build out their Excel performa. 
And it really helps them get a view of what their monthly rate needs to be. And then we can do a SWOT analysis in the community, pulling up all the demos, the travel time, what's in the area. You know, when you pull up fitness on a map, a lot of times when you view in, it's boutique after boutique after boutique, but there's no traditional health clubs around. And so you the, let the franchisee, you so you guys aren't forcing them to get locked into a specific price. So I can create a different price if I have a Chicago club in a tier one market. And if I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We're going to work. We're going to work with you on that pricing model because not every community and every market is can, can, you know, created equal. And what you just said is a good example of the marketing. You can't market the same way in Chicago Oak park that you're going to, uh, that you're going to market. Yeah. You can't use the same pictures. You can't use yeah. the same words. Our creative and marketing team is this is what we focus on is that type of market diversity. Your market, you have to market in different communities with different pictures. You have to have franchisees want to express who they are through their marketing and their culture. Uh, you know, that's really important part of what we do. It's not so cookie cutter. Which, which is, I think, um, uh, Metabolic is a franchise I, I do a lot of work with. And I one thing I really like about them is they don't show up with, here's the seven floor, pro, floor plans you have to follow. Here's this color print on this wall has to be this. They allow each location to have its own vibe and flavor depending where it's at. And for franchisees, that is one of the things that, Eventually, even if they're financially successful, they're constantly butting their heads up against the wall corporately. I want to change this, but apparently I can't have a fucking half wall here because corporate yeah. said no to it. And yeah. when it, when it just it's completely illogical. And I understand the entire model of franchising. I keep the num I keep the revenue high when I keep things consistently the same. And I understand that a thousand percent. But it does. I think for the franchisee, it becomes, you know, it gets them a little jaded and they kind of again they they mm -hmm. want to flap their wings a little. And who's better to experiment with new shit than the people in the trenches anyway and try out new new things and then send the data up to corporate. It worked. It didn't work. But if we go back to the numbers there, let's say we're doing 800 people. And would you say maybe in a tier two ish market, 60 bucks a, a month is a fair price, maybe in a Chattanooga, Tennessee? Yeah. I mean, I think it, well, it's going to depend on the immediate household income around that area. That's going to okay. be really important to look at and the competition. But you, you, if you can land in that $50 range, you're in, you're in good shape. You know, you have your recovery, you have a clean space, you know, you're that $50 range is a really healthy place to live. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's very competitive in that range. You know, you're, you look around these, these smaller footprint clubs, everybody's kind of raising their price, but their offering is the same. It's like, wait a second, two years ago, you've had the same equipment 10 years ago, same equipment, same owner, same floor, same paint on the wall, same everything. I'm paying 30 bucks a month. My buddy just came in and he's paying 50. Nothing's yeah. changed. Why, why did we do that? So I, I like, so I like this. So uh, let's say we got 50 bucks a month. We hit our 800 members. We got our easy math, $40,000 in monthly recurring revenue. And let's say you're in a 5,000 uh, square foot spot. You know, we're generating, you know, I mean, like the revenue per square foot is kind of where I was, where I was looking at with you guys mm -hmm. on there. Cause I, uh, Revenue per square foot is something that most small business owners, we're just like, what lease can I afford? And uh, is it in the right part of town or not? Whatever. It's what I can afford. I'm going to go with it. We never really think about the constant is the real estate cost. That is a constant mm -hmm. cost. HR will kind of, eh, it'll do this a little bit. Um, you'll have some other variable costs, but your real estate is going to constantly go up. If you even have a standard commercial real estate lease, you're going to see a 3% increase every single year. Um, you know, I work with people of you know, like now, especially after COVID, installing into membership agreements at the annual anniversary of your membership, you will see a 3% increase. That way you never have to send a price raise email ever again in your fucking life. It's just baked in there and nobody ever notices 3%, right? It doesn't really impact. No one's like looking at like, I was paying $50 last month, last year. Now I'm paying 5175. Fuck this, right? It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't hit the Richter scale, but your yeah. franchisees have, in, have increasing real estate costs every single year. It's going to yep. go up, um, especially if they're in triple net leases, which probably most of them are. How most do you guys, are be. yeah. How do you guys navigate that when it comes to, okay, guys, we're looking at real estate from a revenue per square, per square foot perspective. And then, you know, do you guys have recur, like our, how do price raises work? And do you do like facility maintenance fee once a year, $75, like, you know, you'll see a lot of the health clubs do. Yeah. So it, it's all about the setup. It's about how you educate your members in the beginning. And this is where our tech comes involved. Everything's done. We have a tiering. So everything's tiered based on the number of members. And we work with you. Now that tiering 
is staging, right? So it's staging from thinking about your equipment, right? We talked about that number, what, you know, small square footprint clubs, members know when things move, members know when things are new, members know the good, the bad, the ugly, and they're going to let you know about it, which is, which is, we think is a good thing. So when it comes to the pricing, it's all the same thing. It's the tiering, it's the staging, it's everything's going to increase over time. Now we do like to lock in our early adapters. The early adapters we like to lock in. They gave us a chance. They opened. They did it during pre-sale. We're going to stay true to the old school. In pre-sale, this is the lowest you're ever going to see. Period. Right? Some markets it'll work. Some markets it's not going to work. But we like to stick with that old school approach to the tiering of the pricing. So as the memberships grow, those early adapters. Their, their pricing stays the same, but then as new members get added, it's tiered, so their prices go up. Pretty common. It's not, it's not, that's not a rocket science. It's happening it, in you know, a not, lot of different gyms. And if I, all the small business owners listening to this are like, wait a minute, the number one thing I constantly hear is like, don't grandfather people into a set price. In your boutique world, guys, these people stick around longer. And that will yep. hurt your average client value, all that stuff longer. In this yep. HVLP model, all those early adopters, will they be around in three years? I'd love to say yes. Odds are maybe not. And so like yep. you you cycle them out of, they get they get flushed out of the pipe and now they're no longer dragging down that average client value. Well, and one thing too is to keep in mind is that we are our own billing company. We are our own CRM. We are our own automation. We control all of that internally. My business partner actually built the operating system for uh, you know the brand we talked about earlier that's still in practice today he built that he's a tech guy right we out we we built code ninjas code ninjas was a franchise we owned prior to this we sold that last year uh, that had 400 locations 760 territories in three countries and that technology came with us we own all that we built it all so that means our owners can set up all their own automations all their own uh, text message email automations call automations we have everything in place. We are our own billing company. We're not using ABC or anybody else. We are our own billing company. That allows us to operate at a lower monthly rate as well. So your base operating expense is going to be lower because we're taking less fees than you. The two brands we mentioned earlier, we're about half, half and royalties per year, half if they're doing the same amount of revenue. What is that? Do you guys, I mean, because are you guys pulling together uh, marketing royalty, like a marketing fee per percent per club per, or per location to put into a national marketing pool? No, no, that doesn't do anything long term. You know how much money you have to store up to, to be get, able to, 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 yeah, to have Times square, time square on New Year's Eve like Planet yeah. Fitness does? Yeah, yeah. No way. <laughs> no way. We want to focus on your market. So my marketing, my digital strategist was Anytime Fitness's digital strategist for seven years, okay? He knows what he's doing. He I recruited him to come to Code Ninjas, and obviously he stayed with us. And uh, so he knows how to do the marketing, right? He knows the digital strategies. He, in fact, right now he's at Google in, in, uh, in San Francisco. So um, when it comes to how we can focus in, um, on our members, our digital strategies, we want, we ask you to spend 3% of your revenue, but we don't take it from you to spend it for you. Like if you want to go and sponsor a team, you want to have a poster up, you want to do something, we're going to trust that you're spending that 3%. If we do an audit uh, and we find out you're not, then boy, we made a mistake together. Unless you're hitting yeah. the right numbers. And if you're not, yeah. well, like you need to come to the annual franchise conference and say what the fuck you're doing to save this yeah. money and still drive those business numbers. Yes. And and we have um, um, one gentleman on my team owned my, uh, multiple, multiple anytimes. I've owned multiple anytimes. Another gentleman on my team, he owned multiple fitness centers. Another one, opened, we, we have people. I lived 13 years of my life on the sales floor selling health club memberships for 13 years. I know what that life is like. And that's one reason on our website, we say no BS, no boring salespeople. And it's, we, we want to put the members in control. But I used to, when I was teaching new franchisee training and people wouldn't pay attention to what we were talking about or they would listen, they were like, oh, this is just the sales part. I'm like, look at, listen, your worst nightmare as a fitness center owner is me opening up across the street because I will put you out of business because this is what I do. And that was what it used to be like. It, now people come in. The last thing why they want to deal with is I don't need a tour. I just want to sign up. Sure. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need you to show me how to walk on a treadmill or how to grab a weight. I just 
want to sign up and I want to go work out. That's becoming very, very common. That whole battle needs to, is, is gone. But like the, the any times in the snap, they're doing great things. They're focusing on the 300 million people that are not a part of a fitness center today. They're going to continue to do great things, but we're going to come in behind and be like, okay, are you done with that atmosphere? Correct. Are you finished over yeah. there? They're Here the farm league for you guys. They're the farm yeah. league for you guys and anyone else in the Evolve My Fitness. I, so my my global gym experience, I was in Ro- Royce Pullum's Urban Active crew and did that whole thing and out of Nashville, Tennessee. And it, it was, I remember even back in the day, you know, I was a, a training director at one of the, the Nashville clubs and just talking like, well, who the fuck needs a tour anymore? Like who needs a tour? Like, honestly, like, and like, you'd listen to the GM, give the tour of the salesperson and you just be like, my God, like who needs it? Now, again, now fast forward to now it's, it's absolutely it, having human beings. And again, this is there. Here's the, the, the confliction I get. People are like, well, are you trying to replace people who currently are in the fitness industry? I said, yes, but only the people who are not looking to make a career of the fitness industry. Yes, your exactly. Front, your front desk, exactly. call, the fucking whatever, the all the little BS jobs that people just have in the interim are not there. No one's like, man, I can't wait to be the front desk lead and make my career doing this. And that's not the, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. It's yeah. a part time gig that you do at a time in your life. Those yep. positions yeah. can be replaced by technology and the consumer would prefer. I mean, how, how dude, I don't care what anyone says about fucking COVID and all that. I love a QR code to scan the menu, order my, like, I love the, yeah. all the different, like, uh, table apps and I can just, they know what table I'm at. I yeah. order the shit. Boom. I don't, love have, to, it. don't have to flag anyone down or f- her. She fucks up the order by accident or I fuck whatever it may be. It's, it's just seamless. You know, I, um, uh, so I, I became friends with Lee Haney. And so when I was going through, we became friends about eight, 17, 18 years ago. And as I was developing this and thinking it through, you know, I called him and I was like, I need to just walk this through with you. Tell me what you're doing right now because of your coaching and what you're doing with what you're seeing with personal trainers and everything. And he's like, Hey, look, I could fill up a 60 hour, a 60 hour week of just virtual coaching. He was, I'm being bombarded with virtual coaching. And it is, and he was, everybody I know, virtual coaching, everybody wants a virtual coach. This is three months ago, you know, and uh, when I first met him, you know, first of all, I have like, didn't really have a filter because I watched him on TV and flex and I was in a parking lot in Alpharetta in Georgia, I think it was just outside of Alpharetta. I shut my car door. I looked up, I see Lee Haney and, and it, it just, I screamed his name like a little girl. Uh, I, I like screamed his name. He looks over and I'm like, oh boy. I'm like, put my head down and I'm like, look back up and I'm like, hey, and he comes walking over, started talking to me. We became friends. We text back and forth and uh, it was quite embarrassing, but you know, it, it worked and uh, we became friends and I called him right away and I'm like, you just got to walk me through this. What am I missing? I called Tony Damon, who is, I would say one of the legends, I mean, in, in the fitness industry, owning health clubs, building health clubs all over the country. I'm like, what am I missing? I don't want you kissing my butt and like rah rah chili. Yeah, poke like, holes in show this. Me, shark, shark poke holes in this for me. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, everybody I've talked to, you know, Dennis Lee, the creator of Octane, you know, one of the, I mean, he's an incredible human being. We, I asked, I talked to him, and he's like, he goes, you're going into a competitive space, you know, what is that thing that you're really trying to do? And my first immediate thing is life after CrossFit. What do we do life after CrossFit? Really now it's life after boutique. What do we do? Life after boutique. Where do you go? Are you going to go to the 150,000 square foot deluxe gym? That's going to cost you 180 bucks a month. Are you going to go to the, 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 the $10, $20 low cost gym? Are you going to go to the anytime or the snap? You know, where do you go after life after boutique? And, and that's where, that's where this all kind of started to come together. I'm like, okay, we need to create a zero staffed, zero staff fitness plus recovery space that allows people to get in, get out higher price point, not the 24 bucks a month. Um, not that, not that low price point, higher price point, quality environment, and a lower cost of entry for the average entrepreneur. I want to work with the guy who's been saving his money, busting his butt. And his dream is to been open up a health club that drives us that, that gives us this fuel because we're helping somebody accomplish their dream. I don't have a lot of people that call and I've worked in franchising a long time that had a dream to open up a taco joint or a dream to open up an Italian restaurant. 
very, very few people have that as a dream. They see it as a numbers game and they look at the numbers only and that's what drives their business forward and their mindset. Where this is very emotional. This is people's dreams. I, I've had people cry because they got turned down for financing. That broke their heart, right? And that's like, it breaks my heart to be able to have to break the news to them and, and work with them. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I love that sense of working with folks that this is what their dream has been. This, I mean, I signed my first lease at 24 years old for a fitness center. And I remember shaking. I'm like, I, I was like so nervous. I'm like, what am I even signing? Oh, personal guarantee. Yeah. Okay. I'll sign that. I don't have anything. This is all that I have anyway. Right. So I'm like, let's do it. And, um, you know, I love working with folks that are going to go through that feeling. I have no problem working with larger groups. Great. But we're driven our passion when we have those average folks come in, those average entrepreneurs, average entrepreneur is somebody that has a net worth of less than 500,000. So just so anybody listening understands what is the average entrepreneur? The average entrepreneur has less than 500,000 net worth. That's average. That is how these other ginormous brands were built. Their lane was this big, if you think of it being a freeway. Their lane was this big with a tremendous amount of flexibility. I was there. I experienced it. They sent me their carpets, their carpet colors and tiles in the mail through an envelope. And I had to look at them. I'm like, you're asking a gym guy if these colors work? Sure, right? The lane was this wide. And then as the brand grew, it went like this and this and this and this. So to go back to your point, everybody has got to live in this space. So they have a vehicle on a really a one, uh, you know, a one way uh, street, one way narrow street. You have to follow the brand. You have to do these things. If you don't do these things, we're going to stick you in default and you're out or you need to sell it. So what's happening, private equity groups are buying these things up like crazy and they own two, three, four hundred of these smaller fitness franchises and they buy, they gobble them up because if they're making two, three thousand dollars a month and they have 300 of them, they're good with that. Yeah. Where an owner is like, okay, well, I opened my, my fitness center. I have my fitness center, but I'm only making 30 grand a year. It's killing me. This is my dream. Now I got to go get a job or somebody can buy it from you for a couple hundred thousand and you're going to sell it and you know, say goodbye to your dream. We leave that lane. We know exactly how that lane needs to look. And we're going to allow you to sway back and forth. But like up here in Minnesota, if you end up getting in the, off the lines a little bit in the middle of winter, you're going to end up in the ditch when you get in that slush. We're not going to let you get in the ditch. We want to keep you in that lane, want to make you per help you personalize your space, but not get you so far off that, you know, you're, ha you're two tires in the dirt and two tires on the road. We've been down that road. We're going to stop you from, from making those same mistakes. Yeah. So two questions I want to make sure to get at. One is um, about how you are solving for the problem. Like you, you said it and I said it. I believe people are going to graduate from the boutique CrossFit scene and then look to go somewhere else. However, as someone who uh, has been in the meetings and helped set up the layouts of health clubs and the Globo Gym type model and the HVLP model, those models were built around the world in the era of bodybuilding. When I say bodybuilding, I mean, I go to one location, I do X amount of sets, X amount of reps. I literally could have, you know, and the big brands have this, the average amount of time someone's going to spend in a certain space and how much square feet they consume in a given workout for the hour that they're there. However, what anyone who has come from the functional fitness boutique micro gym world and has then had to go to a gold's gym while they're visiting their grandma for Christmas finds out those gyms are not laid out and set up for you to be able to do your dumbbell hang power cleans, a couple burpees, a pull up, and then use a rower. And that is for me, if I believe my consumers coming over from that world where all my modalities were in one spot, a lot of the HVLP models, and I'm very curious to see how like world Gym's going to do this with their thing, but like, how is the facility being laid out so that I can easily come over and do that? Cause the number one reason someone stays at a CrossFit gym, even though they want to cancel, even though they no longer want the recipe is because like, it just, it's too fucking hard to try to do this workout at the YMCA or at the local yeah. world's gym. How are the you YMCA, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how yeah. are you guys thinking of the operational capacity of a nomadic floor client experience? Yeah. So, and, and so being that, and probably like you, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm 48 years old, right? I train five days a week. I've done every type of workout you can possibly imagine. Um, 
uh, that has come across my plate over the past, you know, 30 some year, 35 years, I've done basically everything. So when I walk into a fitness center, I, I automatically know the feel of what's going on. Can I get my stuff done here? Right. So I take that into account in my own head whenever we, when we were doing this and, and I'm not sure if this speaks to you or not, but when I walk into a gym and I see like five racks across the back wall, I know I can get my workout in here. Like right off the bat, like there's a, there's a $4,000 expense from an owner that when you're an experienced user and you walk in and you see four racks across the back wall, automatic, you're like, yep, I'm home. This yeah. is fantastic. You need to have a chance to look around. You just saw eight foot racks across the back. You see four of them stacked off and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to be comfortable here. Right. So it, it goes with making sure that, that one, the racks are important. The flooring under the racks are important. The bumper plates are important. Uh, the kettlebells are important. You know, the, the sled, the tank, for example, that torque sells, you know, I, I worked with torque a lot on, on the tank. Uh, over the last 10 years. And, and I'm obviously sold on that piece. Um, having things like having those little pieces, it's the little things people don't understand. They think, oh, it's going to be all the select rise. It's going to be the cardio. No, no, no. The real experienced user, it's the little things. What kind of bars do they have? What kind of multi-grip bars do they have? Do they have wide grip, uh, you know, the wide grip handle? What kind of, what kind of accessories do they have? Do they have it's all lines. those little things. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. It's all those little tiny things of those accessories that the experienced user is going to notice and the experienced user is going to fall in love with. Um, it's not because you have the, you know, techno gym, you lay, you get, I'm not sure if you've used techno gym, but you like don't want to get up. It is so nice and such good quality. When you get into a piece, when you get into that shoulder press and you sit there, you're like, yeah, I'm going to stay. <laughs> I, I become the person who doesn't get off the machine, which I hate. But when I sit on the techno gym, I'm like slow memory foam. This thing is comfortable. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah. Um, you don't need to have this 15 different selectorized pieces. You don't sure. need to have that much. And, and the more and more virtual coaching, I go back to what's old is new again. And I keep saying it over and over to everybody I've talked to, what's old is new again. Saunas were a big thing. Saunas were everywhere. And then they disappeared, right? Then it got removed with like bathrooms Tan and showers. Yeah. Bathrooms and, and showers. And tanning, and tanning, and tanning beds. Yeah. And, and you think of like, like showers and bathrooms, hardly anybody in boutiques, nobody showers in boutiques. Yep. They go home and shower. Right. So it, it's uh, what's old is new again. And what's happening in our industry. Um, we're as being, we're being efficient. We want to make sure our franchisees have a low base operating expense. We want to make sure they know what they're getting into. We're not a turn and burn franchise. We don't work with brokers. So when you're working with me, I'm somebody you can talk to or anybody on my team in the future. These are not brokers. These are, these are invested team members. So everything that you do, we're, in, we're actively involved with. Um, we don't take control over your process, but we're going to coach you through it because passion could put blinders on and you don't realize what you're doing. You have like nine different abduction, adduction machines in there. And it's like, yeah, time out. You, you probably don't need that many inner outer thigh machines. Okay. You probably, if you want to do one, do one, but let's make it multi-use. Sure. It's little pieces, little things like that. We walk owners through to be sure that they're set up correctly. So now let me ask you this. This is where most people have the biggest question. Uh, when I, when I bring up any, any new concept that is franchised mm -hmm. off the bat. How do we franchise without a proof of concept, without a, <laughs> a, a flagship location that's got three years on the books, fucked up in year one, learned in year two, sophisticated by year three, here's the new playbook, let's go. Um, or is it one of these things where it's like, listen, the model has been around for a while. We're looking at an HVLP model, guys. We are tweaking these six outlier things, which is what gives us a unique sales proposition in the market. But that tweaking doesn't necessarily change the overall game plan, the fucking offense and defense playbook. So the need for a um, a, a pro proof of concept is not as much there. Also, by removing HR, by not adding these obnoxious royalty fees and a marketing fee and things like that, we have more potential profit margin in the industry than anyone else. So even if our projections, because we don't have a fucking one location that's got three years of numbers on the books, 
even if so, we're off by a little bit, you're still probably having a higher profit margin than most than most unit, uh, other units of different franchise brands in the industry. And, you know, I had to fight my partner to take this to a franchise because he just wanted it corporate. That's all he wanted. He's, we're, you know, we're focused, you know, right now the, the uh, we're budgeted um, with money on the side for a hundred locations for a corporate office, right? So um, when, we, when you, you think about like proof of concept, anytime fitness started, no corporate locations. They didn't have corporate locations for years and years and years. Snap Fitness didn't have corporate locations for years and years and years and years. They tapped into their network and then their network that they had as friends and family and maybe some coworkers. And I know for a fact, it was a coworker at any time that opened up the first few locations, Eric Keller, you know, Cambridge, Minnesota, Ham Lake, Minnesota, North Branch, Minnesota, where he opened up locations and he was the first franchisee. Um, he wasn't, that wasn't backed by the corporate office. So um, proof of concept in, in terms of this space, it's a little bit different because that's, this is how a lot of these brands started. And then they changed their model as time went on. But the fundamentals are the fundamentals. The core is the core. And it's not easy. If, this, if everybody could do this, then, then they would. But the technology to work, the technology, the billing, to work with your security cameras, to work with your tailgating system, to work with the billing company, to work with how members sign up and how guest passes, that technology is not easy to put into one system. That is very difficult to do. And obviously, we've had a lot of time to work on it and a lot of experience in that realm. So we're able to put it all together. And so when we think of like proof of concept in the fitness space, it, it's, you know, we can talk about what's just happened in the F45 world. Was that proof of concept? They dropped their evaluation by $100 million. Is that proof of concept? I mean, if that's proof of concept and they're, they had to cut their profits, half the people are jumping ship. Now they might get purchased, you know, by their biggest shareholder at like two bucks a share when one time it was selling at 17. Um, is that proof of concept? Or is, is you know, I, I, you know, I, so I kind of challenge that in this space. Um, other spaces, I totally understand, right? I totally get, we need that. In the fitness space, a little bit different. I, I agree. And when someone, when someone makes the argument, I, I believe you can franchise an idea without a proof of concept because every great business was just an idea one, until it was a one of one. Right. And then yep. so on and so forth. It's um, it's interesting. Now, I think a lot of I think the small business owner who owns a like a boutique, a micro gym, whatever it is, their own private little corporately owned mom and pop health club. They look at this and they, it, it pisses them off. They'd be like, fuck, they f Iron 24. What the fuck? There's seven. There's 50 of them already. Like they haven't even opened one. Where's the one? Where can I go to see the one? Like, how do they <laughs> do that when I'm still struggling in year nine to fucking do this? And that's where, again, I tell people when you open up your gym. If you're literally opening up something that has been written, it, it's not new. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have an edge to it. Then sure. There's plenty of proof of concepts you can go and look at when you open up something that's truly unique, something that I always look at this 5149. I want 51% of people to look at me and go, dude, that's, that's pretty, tell me more about it. And I want 49% of people to be like, you're fucking insane. There's no way this is going to work. Like when I land on that, I have I've, I have a feeling, a gut instinct that I might be on to something if I've split the hallway like that. But any new idea, a new concept is not going to be able to produce a proof of concept for you. It's got to do the one thing first and then proof. And by the time you sit back as not an early adopter and you look at it you're like, OK, seven years in, they're doing really good. There's 220 of these things. I promise you it's going to cost a lot more to get involved now at this point. You know, well, and, and yeah, and you back up to what's proof of concept. I guess everybody has a different opinion on what that means. Proof of concept could mean, well, hey, you know, these other clubs have done it. These other franchises have done it. So why can't this franchise do it? Um, proof of concept could be well, I need more data. So to for me to have proof of concept, I need three years of data for you to show me where another person could mean I need 90 days worth of data for you to show me. So proof of concept, I think, is really subjective where people are all over the board with it. And and what I'm what when I was at any time, I remember um, I got one of the very first TRXs, the very first ones. It's like I think it actually is like number two. And, um, you know, I remember thinking to myself, this is the coolest thing ever. And everybody's like, no, this is ridiculous. It's a couple of handles on a rope. I'm like, no, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be big. And, you know, and they're like, no, no, that's not going to be a thing. Obviously, it turned out to be a huge thing. 
um, with any time. I mean, I remember being there and people calling up and telling them, nobody's going to do this. You have no, how are you going to get insurance? Nobody's going to, nobody's going to come work out 24 hours a day. This is ridiculous concept. Obviously proved them to be wrong. At Code Ninjas, nobody's going to drop their kids off to learn how to code. You guys are living in a fairy tale land within five years we're the largest in the world. Uh, one of the fastest growing youth franchises ever in the history of the world in franchising. Um, obviously they were wrong. Coming over here, it's not so much as saying it's not going to work. It's more or less, how are you going to compete with these other ones that are just like you? Sure. And it's like, well, give me some time, dial in, dive in with me. And you're going to see in detail on um, we're not, I, my goal isn't to take down anytime or snap or anybody else. My goal is to make you the most successful in your market. My goal is to make sure that you're doing everything right and that this was a great investment for you and that you and your market are going to be great and you're going to service your community. My goal is not to go after the nearest anytime or the nearest snap or the nearest mom and pa. My, that's, not, that's not our goal. Uh, we want to make sure you're the most successful in your market. We don't ignore everybody. We do a full SWOT analysis, but it's really important to understand the drive of the company because if the drive in the company is to be the biggest ever and the best ever, then they're going to sell territories every three miles. Our territory process, I learned from that, those mistakes. I watched owners struggle because they decided to put another one three miles away. And I'm like, I watched them crumble, cry, sell their business, going from producing 40, 50 grand a month in, 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 their, in their remits down to, down to 20, down to 15. And it's like, wow, they, that franchise put another one there and destroyed this franchisee's income, destroyed it, and then brought this one up to be more mediocre. So now they're both lower end versus having a high one out there that was crushing it. I'm not going to let that happen. We're not putting locations every three miles. We are not doing that. We have a completely different process that involves travel times, travel distances, income, territories, where other ones can be. So when somebody becomes a franchisee, they're already going to know where other locations can be because I walk them through it and show them. So it's never a surprise and they know ahead of time. And um, you know that, that watching franchisees crumble because three miles away, Another friend, I watched him go from driving a Bluebell ice cream truck, Bubba Walker, buddy, if you're listening, going into opening up his very first health club in Red Oak, Texas, doing fantastic, went to his location, visited him, crushing it, and then three miles this way, three miles this way, three miles that way. He gets surrounded. Sure. Yeah. Forced F to sell. Yeah. F45 forced to sell. is the worst about that. Yeah. yeah. And then moves to moves back to his home state in Louisiana, builds a big, beautiful health club. You know, with you know, but he understands now um, what the franchise is about and what they were trying to do because they're trying to be the biggest and the best, and they call it brand awareness. They call it no, no, work together with your franchisee sure. that's that's three point one miles away from you. Yeah, no, we we uh, we're getting pressure to go IPO, and we need fucking as many of these things popping up as we can. Yeah, um, I think F forty five is gonna be such a great cautionary tale for people in the next like three years. I can't wait for the Netflix documentary. Uh, <laughs> all right. Marty, listen, brother, I appreciate your time today. I'm I'm pumped. Where where's the first location? When when are you gonna have an opening at the first one? Like, what's the one? Conroe, that's yeah, Conroe, Texas should be open okay. in the next four weeks. Parallel, Texas should be open in the next forty five days. Okay. Um, um, another one in uh, up by up in Texas, out, outside of Houston, just north of Houston. Um, that space is already ready to go. They're just negotiating the lease. And we have uh, Florida, uh, Louisiana, another one in Florida, um, Mississippi, uh, Oklahoma. So they're all I'd love, I'm going to get in contact months. with you. I'm going to hit you up yeah. and get in contact with you. I'd love to schedule something in early 2023 to come on down with the cameras and just get some cameras on the spot and do some do some content there, if you wouldn't mind, man. I think that'd be I'd, a lot I'd of fun. Be, that'd be awesome. That'd be fantastic. If anyone was listening to this and they want to know more about potentially uh, adding to their fitness portfolio or, or learn more about the franchise opportunities within Iron24, where can they reach you? Yeah, so um, the email might be a little bit strange, but Marty at franchise are. So Marty, M-A-R-T-Y at Franchise R, which is F-R-A-N, Zar, right? Ch Char Zar. So what I can do is I can give you that, but it's- Yeah, I'm going to um, put in the show notes. I'll put in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, do that. And then also you can do Marty at iron, uh, iron24.com as well. Um, so, or our website obviously is great. Um, I love to give people my cell phone number. People think I'm crazy for it, but if anybody ever wants to text me or call me, it's 763-516-3578. 
Um, I live, breathe, and die by my calendar and my phone, and I'm fully dedicated to uh, making time to chat with anybody who wants to uh, who wants to dig in. Awesome, dude, brother. This was an absolute pleasure. I appreciate your time. I'm excited for what you got coming up, and um, I will make sure for us to connect here again soon. Yeah, awesome, man. Thanks for your time.